Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, we hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. So I wanna share a story with you this morning. It's a story about a man named Job who lived thousands of years ago. But the story doesn't actually begin with Job. The story actually begins in kind of a heavenly board meeting. You see, the story opens and God has called together kind of these uh, celestial council members. And the meeting is starting and one of the council members by the name of Hasatan, or the challenger, has just come into the room and God says to the challenger, where have you just come from? And did you notice my faithful servant, Job? And Hasatan says, actually, I have noticed Job. He's faithful, he loves God, He's upright and righteous. He does good instead of harm. But I wonder, the challenger says to God, if Job would be faithful and good if you hadn't blessed his life so much. I mean, let's be honest, God. Job's life is awesome. You've given him everything he could have possibly dreamed of or asked for or imagined. He essentially has it all. He's well known, he's popular, he has wisdom. People come to him to help solve their problems. He has immeasurable wealth, a successful business, a large and beautiful family. So of course, Job would be faithful to you. Of, of course Job would call you his God. But I wonder, the challenger says, if Job would worship you and pray to you and call you his God, if you withheld the blessing, if you withheld the good things from his life, if all of it went away. You see, in this boardroom, what's happening right now is a wager. A wager is taking place about this man, Job's life. And Job has no clue, has no clue what's happening. And so God says to the challenger, okay, I hear you. I think Job will continue to be faithful even if he didn't have all of those things. And so you have my permission to go do as you wish. The one thing that you're not allowed to do is touch a hair on his head. Everything else is fair game. And so the challenger does his worst. And in a moment, Job loses everything that he holds near and dear to his heart his business, his wealth, his children, his livelihood. Tragedy strikes and all of it is gone. Can you imagine what that must feel like when all of a sudden, out of the blue, everything that you've worked for, everything that you've built, everything that you're grateful for is just gone. Job continues in the midst of this immense tragedy, continues to praise God, continues to call God faithful. So the challenger goes back into the heavenly board meeting and God says, have you noticed my faithful servant Job? Yeah, the challenger says I have. 
but I don't know. He still has his health. And if he wasn't healthy, if you allowed me to take his health, watch. I think it would be over. I don't think he would be faithful to you anymore. And so God says to the challenger, okay. You can take his health, but you are not allowed to take his life. And so in the story we see after Job has lost everything near and dear to him, he wakes up one morning with painful boils from the top of his head to the bottoms of his feet. And it's here where we continue Job's story. And we see Job's friends, he's got three of them, and they come to be with Job in the midst of his suffering. They know Job, Job is well known across the land. And he has three friends that show up and they do a good job in the beginning. They're with Job, they sit with Job in his grief, but about two weeks in, it's not good. You see, these friends, believe that God rewards the good and punishes the wicked. That God gives good gifts and good things to those who do good things, who are faithful to God, who are righteous and upright. And they believe that God punishes those who make mistakes, those who mess up, those who don't pray enough or do enough or give enough. And so they begin to say to Job, Job, okay, buddy, come on. It's been two weeks. I think it's time for you to to admit to God what you did wrong. Job, I I think it's time for you to finally like own up to your part in all this because this doesn't happen when you're faithful to God. This doesn't happen when you're making good choices. This doesn't happen when you're really following God. And Job is steadfast in his innocence. I did not do anything wrong. I am innocent. And we see the friends and Job go back and forth and the friends are relentless to the point where the friends begin to make stuff up. They begin to paint pictures of sins that Job must have done because there's no way in their worldview this kind of tragedy and suffering would happen to a faithful, upright, good servant of God. But Job is innocent. And he keeps saying he's innocent. And here's the thing. The friends don't believe him and they don't know because they weren't at this heavenly board meeting that took place where we know God says Job is, in fact, blameless and innocent. Job has no clue what happened in that heavenly board meeting. He doesn't know why he's suffering, but all of a sudden his worldview is called into account because he also previously had thought, you do good things, you get good things. You do bad things, you get bad things. If you're faithful, God rewards you. If you make bad choices and you sin, God punishes you. And all of a sudden, Job's experience is not lining up with what he had previously thought of God. And we see Job on this emotional roller coaster. Can you imagine if this was happening or or you've experienced things similar to this where tragedy strikes all of a sudden, there's, there's almost this sense of like you're in it and you're solving the problems and you're doing what you can and then all of a sudden you go, wait a second. This is not okay. This is not fair. And we see Job become angry, not only with his friends, but with God. And we see Job take all of his honest, raw confusion and emotion to God. And Job demands an audience with God. And God shows up in the midst of a storm cloud. And what we see in the story is God does not answer the question of why is this suffering taking place? Why has all of this happened? What God does 
is he takes Job on a 3D tour of the cosmos. And he shows Job from the smallest of God's creation to the most awe-inspiring parts of the cosmos, the intricacies and the details that go into creating and running the world and the cosmos. And what we see in Job is he never gets an answer. He never understands or knows what was taking place in this heavenly wager. He never gets an answer as to why the suffering has happened to him, but he has an encounter with the love of God and the goodness of God and the awe-inspiring creator of the universe. And we see Job begin to hold these questions and emotions and confusion with a humility because he has an encounter. We see Job begin to consider that this idea of if I am good, then God will reward me. And if I am bad, then God will punish me. It begins to shift to something different and better and truer and more beautiful. By the end of the story, God has given back Job everything times two. But not because Job did what Job needed to do, not because Job got it all right, not because Job needed to be rewarded. It was just a gift. A gracious, kind, unearned gift. Crazy story, right? I mean, what in the world could this story, written thousands of years ago, maybe even one of the earliest stories we have in the scripture, what could it possibly have to do with your story and my story? What could it possibly have to do with our lives today? I know that many of you came in carrying heavy stories. You've experienced the surprise of tragedy without answers, without explanation. Maybe that's not your story right now, but you know and love and care for someone who is experiencing suffering and you can't fix it. You want to make it go away, but you can't make it go away. Maybe you're someone who's looking at the world around us today and the way that innocent people suffer, and you're going, what, what do we even do with this? You see, the story of Job never answers the question of why do we suffer. That's not the reason the book of Job was written. And so if we're looking to Job to answer that question, it's not going to work. But I think there are three things, at least three things, that we see in the story of Job that are helpful for us when we are suffering and when others around us are suffering. And we're going to look at those today. I think the first one is it helps us to understand in the midst of our suffering how to think about God. Where is God? What is God doing? How is God responding, reacting, all of that? The second piece would be how do we interact with God in the midst of our suffering? And then the third one is how do we love others well when they're suffering? Now, we have scholars on two ends of the spectrum when it comes to the book of Job. We have some scholars who look at the text written all of those years ago, and they've come to the conclusion that this is a historical work of art with a real man named Job and real accounts that actually occurred a really long time ago. And then you have other scholars on the other end of the spectrum who would look at this inspired work as a literary account. So a literary account that is true in the sense that it's a story that helps us to understand 
truths about ourselves and truths about God and the world that we live in. And as a diverse community of friends here at Rancho, we have people on both ends of that spectrum, and it's part of what makes us beautiful. And whether we believe this to be a real story that actually happened the way that it's written or a true story that has truths that help us to understand God and ourselves, what we can unify ourselves around is the reality that this story does have inspired truths that help us to understand ourselves and to understand God, especially in the midst of our suffering. The other thing that I want to point out to you that I think you might find helpful, especially if you've been familiar with this story growing up in church, is that we tend to read it and we see it translated as Satan and God are interacting. And we think of it as a New Testament Satan or devil, the way that we understand that New Testament being. Most Hebrew scholars would disagree with that. They would say that this is Hasatan, which is the challenger. This is not a name for a person in Hebrew. It's a title. And this is, this is an important. So we see this in the Hebrew as a definite article. And in Hebrew, a definite article never comes before a person's name. And so another thing that has those Hebrew scholars going, yeah, we don't know for sure, but definitely doesn't point to it being that New Testament being, is Hasatan is also located in three other Old Testament passages, two of which it's referring to an angel of the Lord as a challenger. And so what we want to do is we kind of want to consider in this verse, like this is a heavenly being Hasatan, who is challenging the ways of the world, the ways of God, the ways that things are interacting. The whole book of Job, one of the primary reasons I think it was written, and many scholars think it was written, was to challenge our thinking about God and the way that things work. So let's look at the first one. I think this is one of the most important reasons that Job was written. It's that Job helps us to understand how to think about God when we suffer. You see, the poet and the author of the story is making a case against something called the doctrine of retribution or the retribution principle. And you see this through the whole story. It's this concept or this idea that many of us may still have some pieces to that if I am good, then God will reward me. But if I am bad, then God will punish me. And if I have a good life, it must mean that I'm doing things right and well and I'm faithful to God. But if I have suffering, then clearly I have messed up. And so this book, this story, was written to help us change our minds about this idea of retribution. Job insists over and over again on his innocence. The whole world had thought, he, he's got it right because his life is good. And the minute he experienced suffering, his friends come in, you, what did you do? What did you mess up? Come on, you must have done something. Clearly, you're not on God's good side anymore, buddy. Because it all went downhill. So you have Job saying, I'm innocent. And you have the friends saying, you're definitely not. But we know because of the beginning of the story that God affirms, Job, in fact, is innocent. One, one of the pieces of the story that... Um, puts this in stark contrast for us, is in Job chapter eight, verse one through seven. So this is one of the friends of Job, and it just clearly paints this picture of what retribution doctrine is, which, by the way, the people of God at the time that this was written, that was their concept of how God worked. That was their concept of what it meant to be in a relationship with God. It was all kind of a tit for tat. Like if I do good things, then God does good things for me. But if I do bad things, then God does bad things to me. So chapter eight, verse one, then Bildad the Shuhite replied to Job, how long will you go on like this? 
You sound like a blustering wind. Does God twist justice? Does the Almighty twist what is right? Your children must have sinned against him. So their punishment is well-deserved. I gotta stop there. I'm gonna come back. Like, can, can you imagine? They can't find something that Job did wrong. And Job is saying, I am innocent. So these three friends go, well, if you didn't do something wrong, then it must have been the kids. And they deserve their punishment. Can you imagine what it would be like to be on the receiving end of that kind of thinking of God in the midst of your own tragedy and in the midst of your own? That's hard to read. It's hard for me to say out loud to you this morning. But this is the doctrine of retribution. And it doesn't stop there. Because it's a if you, then God kind of ideology. But, the friend says, if you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, and, doesn't stop there, if you're pure and live with integrity, he will surely rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, You'll end with much. I mean, this is awful. So how is this also our story? This if then, if God, then I kind of thing. So as I was reflecting this week, like currents of this have made its way forward into our lives and into our theology and into our churches. Um, when, when suffering hits uh, people that we love and we're close to or even people that we will never know, um, there's a part of us that wants to believe they did something to earn it because it helps us manage our own anxiety. It's this sense of like, if I can convince myself that like you did that to you in some way, shape, or form, or you deserve it, then it distances me from you and I don't have to worry that tragedy will befall my life because I'm gonna do what I need to do to make sure that doesn't happen. It gives us this false sense of security and control that we really don't even have. One of the ways that this is still something that I continue to have to change my thinking around, like I understand it rationally, but in my heart, God and I are still getting there, is with tithing and giving generously, financially. So at 15, I became a follower of Jesus and at the time, I was the only one working in my home. I had two younger siblings. I was going to school, trying to finish things up, and I was working. And every month, I was trying to figure out, do I pay the water bill or the electricity bill? Like, we're choosing here. And you may have made a different choice along the way, but I always picked water because we could live without the electricity, but like, we need some water. I gotta take a shower. And so this was like what was happening in our world at the time. And I start going to church and God just completely grabs a hold of my life and my heart in a really incredible way. And they start, you know, taking an offering, which is fantastic. Nothing wrong with taking an offering. We do here. Generosity runs everything that we're capable of doing. But somehow, I don't even know how, this concept got planted in my mind that I needed to give, I was making 5.15 an hour. I needed to give 10% of my income so God would bless my finances. And also, if I didn't give 10% of my income, of my 515 an hour, then God would punish me. I don't know how this got into my brain, but it did. And so all of these years later, as my husband Ryan and I, and not that Ryan, my, my Ryan, I have to clarify that sometimes, we give consistently and generously. And I want to say that it is because we truly understand that God is inviting us to hold on to our finances and our money and our stuff loosely because that transforms our heart and our soul and it's good for us. But I think there's still a little bit of fear in the back of my mind sometimes that like if I don't give enough, it's gonna go bad. This is retribution principle. And it's not a God of grace and a God of mercy, and a God who just wants to give good gifts 
to his kids. Jesus t- teaches in the New Testament against retribution theology. I found three examples, and I don't have time to go into them, but I at least wanted to mention them to you so you know we have a New Testament Jesus connection. So the first one would be when the disciples ask him, uh, why was this man born blind? Surely it must be because his parents sinned. We do this to parents, don't we? Like their kids or their teenagers make choices that are not good and we go, well, surely they did something wrong as parents because I don't wanna consider that my kids might grow up to make not so great choices. Like this is this, is this idea, right? And Jesus says, no, you've got it all wrong. It has nothing to do with his sin or his parents' sin. And then we see another example in the parable of the workers. The farmer goes out, hires some workers first thing in the morning, tells them what their wage is gonna be for the day, they go to work. And then he goes back out and gets more and they come later in the day and they're working and he goes back out and he gets more and then they're working. And then he goes out an hour before the day ends. This is when I'd like to show up for work. And he hires some more workers. They show up to work an hour before the day is done. I want that gig. And the workers who were there first thing in the morning, they're excited because they're like, okay, if those guys are getting what we thought we were going to get, surely we're going to get quadruple. It's going to be awesome. Like pay day. First workers get paid full amount. Our workers, I mean, they get paid the full amount. It goes down. They're all getting, they're like, yeah, we're gonna, this is going to be good. And the farmer gives them what they agreed to. And they are not happy about it. This is not fair. And what the farmer says is, who are you to talk to me about how I can be generous with my good gifts? And then the third example would be the parable of the prodigal son, where the brother who the older brother, the good one, the righteous one, the upright one, who's done all the things right and well and good the whole life, just watched the younger brother go just like squander and destroy everything and like comes back with his tail between his legs and his dad throws this big party and puts the ring on his finger and like kills the best fatted calf and he goes to the father and he's like, you've not thrown me a party. He made bad choices. He made mistakes. He did this to himself. What about me? We say, God says, everything that I have is already yours. But he was lost and now he's home. So we we have Jesus looking at this retribution principle through three different lenses. Suffering of the innocent, giving people more than what they actually deserve in a good way. And we see God giving good gifts even to us when we make mistakes. Like, this is the opposite of what they were thinking about in the story of Job. And then the second thing Job helps us to understand is how to interact with God when we suffer. Job teaches us to take our pain and our anger and our confusion directly to God. We often will start out taking it to our people, our close friends, our small group, even our pastors. And all of that is good and necessary and a part of the process. But Job teaches us, do not stop there. The humans and the people in your life, the doctrines and the theological principles are not going to have the answers that you're looking for when suffering happens, when tragedy strikes. When that happens, we take all the messy emotions, all the worst of our anger and despair and accusation, we go directly to God. We see this in Job. Chapter 23, verse 1 through 7, Job says, I am not letting up. I am standing my ground. My complaint is legitimate. God has no right to treat me this way. It isn't fair. If I knew where on earth to find him, I'd go straight to him. I'd lay my case before him face to face, give him all of my arguments firsthand. I'd find out exactly what he's thinking and discover what's going on in his head. Do you think he would dismiss or bully me? No, he'd take me seriously. 
One of the scholars that I learned a lot from when I was preparing is a priest in Latin America who wrote a commentary on the book of Job who understands culturally what it's like when innocents suffer. And so he writes this, he says, this is Gustavo Gutierrez, he says, his full encounter with God, he's talking about Job, comes by way of complaint, bewilderment, and confrontation. You see, when suffering happens and tragedy strikes, the ideas and the theology and the thinking only takes us so far. We need an encounter with God. This is what we see happen with Job. And that means we take all the mess of what we're feeling and all of our questions straight to God. I was with an individual this week who is facing unimaginable suffering. And they're just beginning to acknowledge for the first time that they are really angry with God about what happened to them because what happened to them was not okay and it wasn't fair. And so to hold space for this individual to say, of course you feel angry. I would too. And God is here for your anger. God can handle it. You can take it straight to him. What we may find when we do this, is that we don't get all of our questions answered. This is one of the hardest parts of my job. I don't have answers for all the questions of why they're suffering and why we suffer and why you suffer. But when we have an encounter with God, what we see in the life of Job and the story, what we see in our own stories and the stories of others, is even if we don't get our questions answered, that encounter opens us up to the love of God, the grace of God, the mystery of God, in a way that helps us to hold the questions and the mystery and the uncertainty with a peace that we really can't explain or understand. And so while we don't get all of the rational explanations, our experience helps us to know the goodness and the grace of God, even in the midst of the worst. The third thing is Job teaches us how to respond to the others when they're suffering because it is what not to do 101 in the book of Job. You do not do what Job's friends did. I mean, if this is like, if you're looking at it as a literary piece where there's a lot of exaggeration in order to make a point, I mean, it is drama. Job 16, one through five. Then Job defended himself, talking to the friends. I have had all I can take of your talk. What a bunch of miserable comforters. Is there no end to your windbag speeches? What's your problem that you go on like this? If you were in my shoes, I could talk just like this to you. I could put together a terrific tirade. I'd really let you have it. But I'd never do that. I'd console and comfort and make things better, not worse. So instead of judgment and blame, what if we respond to those around us and those far from us who are suffering with compassion? I think that's one of the things that we learn from the book of Job. Compassion means we feel with those who are suffering. We mirror their emotions. We allow ourselves to feel their grief, to feel their fear, to feel their anger. We feel it with them, but compassion doesn't stop there. Compassion looks like presence. And listening when someone is suffering, listening without trying to fix or diminish or solve may be one of the greatest gifts that we can give to someone. It means acknowledging reality. Sometimes this looks like just saying to someone, this is really hard. instead of diminishing what they're experiencing and what they're carrying and what it takes to navigate it, to just call a spade a spade and to acknowledge reality. 
And then it doesn't stop there. Compassion acts with care and kindness. It's an action. It it takes into consideration with discernment uh, based off of this unique individual and their unique story. What does it look like to care for them, to show up for them with kindness? And I got to be honest with you, this is vulnerable because sometimes we get it wrong. Because what you need in the midst of suffering and tragedy is going to maybe be different than what I might need in the midst of tragedy and suffering. And so sometimes I'm going to do for you what I would maybe think I would want you to do for me, but it's the wrong thing and I make it worse. And so we do this dance and this discernment with the Spirit of God where we go, okay, I'm feeling with this person and I'm listening and I'm present with them. What does it look like to show care and kindness in the midst of what they're experiencing? This can be just a practical act of kindness. I'm going to show up and I'm going to take your kids for the afternoon. I'm going to send you a meal. I'm going to send you a note, a card that's just got an encouragement in it, reminding you of how awesome you are. I mean, It requires some intentionality and some prayerful thought. But it's part of how we show up for people in the midst of their suffering. That Latin American priest also wrote, as he's concluding kind of what we take from the story of Job, he says, in Job, the choice is between a religion that sets conditions for the action of God and applies a calculus to it, which we want to do because it helps us feel like we can control things. Like if I can put a calculus to the way the world works and why things happen, then I can kind of understand it and I can prevent things from happening and I can keep myself safe. Do you see how that kind of works? So in Job, the choice is between a religion that sets conditions for the action of God and applies a calculus to it and a faith that acknowledges the free initiative at work in God's love, in God's grace, in God's goodness, to make no choice between the two is to live in despair and cynicism. And so today, I think the invitation for us as we read this story is let's choose to live a faith to choose a faith that trusts in the inexplicable, wholly free, uninhibited love of God. Job is primarily a book of poetry. And so I thought it fitting to end our story today with a poem who's written by a young woman named K.J. Ramsey who knows suffering. She's well acquainted with it. She has an autoimmune disorder that has led to a life that is just filled with constant pain. Um, And so she's written this book. It's called The Book of Common Courage. And I think you may find her words to be an encouragement today. She writes, You do not need to think your way to faith. Fierce enough to frighten fragility into a footnote. You do not need to lace your lips with lustrous prayers or pound your chest in penance for the puzzle of your pain. You do not need to be hopeful or pleasant, stumbling severed from your story and the truth your body bears. You only need to let your hidden hurt come with you and reach your fingers towards the love who stands with scars still on his hands. Your body brings your story everywhere you go. And faith says, come with me. I won't leave you alone. Come whole, weary, weak, to the corners where you've long been pushed aside. Come with courage of the crucified. His body brings his story everywhere we go. And faith says, he comes with me. He won't leave me 
alone. Your body brings your story where Christ makes you his home. Let's pray. God, thank you that you make your home within us. Thank you that in the midst of our suffering and the suffering of others, you are with us and you've experienced it all. God, help us to change our thinking where we need to change our thinking. God, help us to bring all of our emotions directly to you, especially where they are extra painful and tender and raw. And may we love others well when they are suffering around us. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.